Good morning. Great to see you guys. Great to be in God's house and worshiping. Can we just give a round of applause one more time for our Alicia who got baptized today? So excited for her. Now, social media, you love it or you hate it or you're like me and it's 100% both. <laughs> You, you, you really love so many things about it. Some of the things I love about social media is I love like lots of the videos that you get to watch. So I like watching this like deep analysis of NFL stuff. Dan Orlovsky is my favorite guy on ESPN, um, but it'll be like, here's a cover three and here's how you break it down with a three step or yeah, a three step slant. And then if you do a hitch route, like all this stuff, I love like getting way into the weeds on that or the Bills draft and all of that, which we did well on and we're probably going to go undefeated. So, um, <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, you know, just start the message off with a little prophecy. You know what I mean? Uh, but no, I, love, I love the NFL stuff. I love, uh, you know, personal finance stuff. I love psychology things. I, I like all kinds of stuff. But if I'm honest, the algorithm doesn't lie. Most of my feed looks something like this. They've assured me it's just something that he'll grow out of and for now i guess i'm just supposed to use patience and understanding <laughs> any parents that can relate to this uh yeah i feel like anytime i'm like hey kids how was your day they're like good i'm like you tell me about it they're like no. <laughs> but if I'm like, hey, I need to have a private conversation with mom. Can you guys leave the room? That is the scene in my living room where they just like, they will not stop talking. So I have this new strategy I've just come up with this week where I'm going to say, I'm going to talk to your mom about something serious. And then they're going to come in and they're going to tell me all about their lives. So um, yeah, I don't know. I'll let you know how that works. But I love so much about social media. There's much I loathe about social media as well, from uh, doom scrolling to being distracted. Uh, but, but the thing that drives me craziest about the content is when I see Christians who are warring over things that I think are absolutely ridiculous. And for other people to see these interactions going on, like, usually I get frustrated, sometimes I get mad, and usually it ends up leaving me sad. Like, this is where we're at. And these are the conversations we are having. And I think for us, like, sometimes we can feel like, you know, hey, uh, these conflicts that happen within the church and, and Christians and things, it's like, man, it's just everywhere all the time. And so maybe it's like unique to this generation. But I remember as, as a young boy growing up in church, my dad uh, has been a pastor, a music pastor for his whole career. Uh, so like 45 years of his life, he has done that. And I remember when I was nine years old, there was this uh, huge conversation going on. It, it was the era in uh, the modern church called the worship wars. And what the worship wars were was uh, really centered upon whether or not modern music should be in the church or whether it was rock music, whether drums were essentially of the devil or whether they could be redeemed. Not just like whether you like drums or not, but like literally that. So like if you can imagine this, like it was a room larger than this one. The whole church split over drums in church. Half the people left. My family moved away from our friends, our family, our loved ones, five states away because of drums in church. Like, that's crazy, right? Like, can, can we just admit that that is crazy? But there has been conflict in the church forever. It's been about baptisms, whether you dunk once or whether you dunk, dunk three times because of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Like, it can be about communion. It could be about the order of service. It can be about the style of music. And there's just fraction after fraction. There are over 30,000 Protestant denominations. That doesn't even include Catholics. Like, that's just Protestants, 30,000 different schisms that we have out here. And so today, the passage that we are about to look at is a conflict that is happening in the early church. In the book of Galatians, in, in the church in Galatia, Paul is writing a letter to these folks. And the question that we are going to be exploring today is how would we even build a faith community that's healthy, 
that can dialogue through conflict, that can process real questions, and that can work together for the gospel. And is that even possible? Or are we just inevitably doomed for the 2024 version of drums in church conversations? <laughs> And so that's where we pick up in uh, our series. We've been doing a series on the book of Galatians. We are in chapter two, and this is uh, the conversation that picks up there. Here's what it says. Then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, Whatever they were makes no difference to me because God shows no favoritism. These folks added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. Now today, we're going to zoom in on three different parts of this passage, and uh, my hope is that we can walk away with uh, three different points that we can, we can pull from this passage together. And if you just listened and you're confused, uh, that's okay. Uh, that's why we gather in rooms like this, so that we can learn, that we can break it down. Um, we can do that in small groups, or we can do it in big groups. Either way, it is uh, beneficial for our souls. So Paul is heading into this challenging conversation with a church that he really loves. He's about to tell them, and he, he says to them, there are these false believers among you. I don't know if you've ever called somebody a false believer, but I could tell you it's not a good thing. <laughs> I, remember, uh, I remember somebody one time, back when I used to lead, lead worship, the, do the music, somebody came to me and they were like, hey, I just want you to know that every time you lead the music at church, you quench the spirit. And I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I knew it was not a good thing. Um, and so uh, we, we dealt with that, we figured it out. But uh, they're having this conversation, and what, what Paul is saying is that these false believers are actually taking and distorting the gospel so much that it is actually going to turn people who follow these false believers' teachings into spiritual slaves. So he's saying this is, this is really, really serious. Here's what it says in verse number one. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, and I took Titus along as well. And this is what's interesting, interesting to me right away, right off the get-go, is Paul brings Barnabas and Titus. He does not have this really crucial conversation around circumcision and whether circumcision is a, a, a prerequisite and a requirement for uh, salvation, but he brings two of his closest and, and closest friends with him, and these are sincere followers of Jesus. And, and we see this truth right away, that our faith questions are best processed together with safe friends, with trusted faith leaders. Because this is, this is how Paul goes about it. And here's the thing. I feel like nobody would say to me, like, yeah, I don't see any value in uh, having faith conversations in community. That, that is a good thing. But that is until someone in our community strongly disagrees with something we care deeply about. Then we're not as keen on this whole community thing. 
And then we can land exactly where Paul was. And here's the thing. This is what I think our natural tendency is, whether you're Christian or, or not. But uh, especially for us as followers of Jesus, is there's typically three responses I see when a conflict is coming. And this is our knee-jerk reaction. This is what comes out of us right away. The first is like, I have to leave this group because this is too important for me. Or second is, you know what? Um, this is within the context of the church. Like, I'm going to go back to the tradition I was raised in because I feel most comfortable there. And this is what's happening for the Jewish people, by the way, is they feel most comfortable in this custom of circumcision. Like, it's been a huge part of their identity, of their culture. And so, like, we need to go back to this. So, for us, we want to go back to what we were raised in. Or three, I'm going to go home. I'm going to read. I want to pray about it. And eventually, essentially what I'm going to decide to do is to cut off these people, get a new group of friends, get new community based on what I decide is best. And actually none of those three options are what Paul decides to do. Paul takes two of his believing friends and he says, let's have a real conversation. He, he says, let's go to Jerusalem to the community of believers and let's process this community together. And here's the thing is that in any community, you're going to have conflicts together. Anywhere there's people, there is going to be conflict because we see things differently. And what I could tell you is that some of my best friends have differing views on parenting, on sexuality, on politics, uh, on, on some of the things, uh, finances, some of the things that are most important to me, we see things very, very differently on. But for Paul, that didn't mean the end of community. This meant that the community needed to work through this topic. So the question for us becomes like, so when, when do I need to like cut off? When do I need to be, when do I need to like fight for this in, in a good way, not fight with, but fight for these relationships. And I, I love the framework that um, is most often attributed to St. Augustine, where he says this, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, but in all things, charity. So in essential is unity. And the essential for us is Jesus Christ, his death, burial, his resurrection, that we are saved by him, by putting our faith and our trust in him. Like this is the cornerstone, the centerpiece of our faith. Or, or another way to look at it might be like looking at the Apostles' Creed. Like this is the essentials that we are unified on. In non-essentials, there is liberty. There is freedom to have differing opinions and views. And this is important for us that we can agree to disagree in these areas. But in all things, charity. In all things, charity. I mean, I, I dream of a day where Christians are known for their kindness, even when they disagree strongly. Wouldn't that be a witness unto itself? And, and for us, we, we express charity because Christ expressed it towards us. He gave us just an unbelievable amount of love, even when we were unlovable. And so for that reason, we can stay in relationship. We can stay friends even through disagreements because our faith is in God, but it is practiced with others. That's the most healthy expression of faith. Now, um, I know for me that part of the way that this plays out, because this can be, this is like good in theory, but it can be hard to do because we've got busy lives and busy schedules and so much going on in our lives. Um, so I, I know that for me, this looks like being a part of a family Bible study. And we wanted to do it every, every other week. That didn't work. We thought that once a month wouldn't work. So we la landed on the odd number of every three weeks, you know, <laughs> Perfect rhythm there. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that happened as, as we met last week is I was uh, reading a section that we were reading together. We read the book of 1 John together, which is a short book. So it sounds way more spiritual than it is if you don't know how long it is. But uh, so we, we read this together. And I remember as I was reading it on my own, the first thing that jumped out at me was like, man, some of the things that they're saying here are in like, seemingly complete contradiction to what we just read in Galatians like the day before at church. And so we talked about that. 
But it wasn't just that. There was also a, another portion, and this was from 1 John 3.13. It said, do not be surprised that the world hates you. And I remember when I was doing like kind of my own devotional study, I remember thinking like, huh, like I've got a lot of people who view the world a lot differently than me that don't follow Jesus in my life, but I honestly don't feel like they hate me. And so maybe I've, I've kind of become like a watered down Christian. Like I'm a Christian light operating out here. Not like a light for Jesus, like, you know, like not operating to my full potential here. And so I brought that up. And one of the community members uh, that was there with me, like shared some really helpful things that helped me see it through a whole different lens and framework. And, and the point is that like, if I would have even just done my own study on my own, which is really good and needed for our souls to like spend time alone with God. But if I would have only done that and not processed my faith in community, I could have actually started applying some of the scriptures in a way that would not have been beneficial for me, would not have been beneficial for my non-believing friends, would not have been beneficial for my future. But instead, this person uh, from our church was able to really uh, change my mindset. And that is very helpful for my future. And so for us, if we've got disagreements, it's a chance for us to lean in to the relationships we have and to process it with people of faith. We were never meant to be on a solo journey, as we see from watching Paul as he interacts with Barnabas and Titus and his whole community. Okay, the sex second section, <laughs> easy for me to say, that I want to uh, zoom in on uh, for today, we pick up at verse three. And this is, again, going to be challenging for those of us who call ourselves Christians. Here's what it says. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Now, the point Paul is trying to make here, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but that there are these false believers and they're actually changing the very nature of the gospel and who is accepted by it. So they're, they're adding this Jewish custom of circumcision to the gift of salvation. Now, like we said, circumcision was a huge part of their culture, of their identity. But what happened is their tradition was elevated to the place of being above its intended purpose. The intended purpose of the tradition was actually to connect them to God, and now it was keeping people out. And traditions are good. I love many traditions. But if we raise our traditions to the place of non-negotiables, what we get is legalism. And this can happen for any one of us, any single one of us. And what Paul says is if, if we do this, we're going to actually turn into spiritual slaves. Now, think about what Paul does to have this challenging conversation. He brings his friend with him. He brings Titus, and Titus is a Greek. Titus is not circumcised. And if you want to learn more about circumcision, please go talk to Pastor Stephen after this service, because man, would he love to have that conversation with you. <laughs> I have some other words, but we'll just go back to God's word, because that seems better. But, um, but this, is, this is what Paul says. He says, like, our guy Titus, like, he's been with us from day one. You know, put it in modern day vernacular. Titus is an OG out here. Like he's been with us forever. Are you going to say that this dude who has been following after Jesus for forever with us, like since, since Jesus came, are you going to say he's not a sincere follower of Jesus just because he didn't take part in this tradition? And it recalibrates the truth of what needed to be said in that community. Paul is saying like, this is not it. But here's the thing. I bet those false believers, I bet they sounded really smart. I bet they sounded really dedicated. I bet they sounded really convincing to the whole community there. And this happens for us today. People can sound really spiritual and use really religious language. 
but it doesn't actually mean that it's right. It might just mean that you're attaching Christianese to something that's not true. And for Paul, he's saying this was completely off. That's what's happening with these false believers. And what intrigues me about this is not even just what Paul says, but how he goes about having the conversation. And I think this is super helpful for those of us who are in this crazy divided world of 2024, that followers of Jesus are concerned with individuals and not just issues. Like, for, for Paul, he brings his brother with him to, to say, like, this is, a, this is the real dude that this is affecting. And so for us, we, we've got to stand up for the truth. Like, truth is real, and truth has a name, and his name is Jesus. Uh, but even as we do it, even as we stand up for truth, we must do it with real people in mind. It's not just these issues out there. There's real people. And so think about this. If, if you're talking about people who are living outside of the Christian sexual ethic, remember, Christians, you're talking about individuals, not just issues. And when we talk about these truths, I, I think the temptation is for us to lump people together and talk about those people, put everybody all together. And it's, it's honestly, it's not helpful. But instead, what I honestly believe that you and I are called to is to be people who are in proximity, who think, who look, who sound, who act, maybe smell <laughs> differently than we do. Like that is the call of the Christian. Jesus hung out with sinners all the time, all the time. And the point and the purpose is not so that we become like them, but so that we can be a light and we can show God's love to others, to people who are hurting to talk about individuals, not just issues, because there's a name and a soul to every issue that we talk about. And for us, our call is to love and show grace and develop real personal relationships where we deeply care, not a bait and a switch, but like a deep, sincere care for other people, where we attach the real truth to love so the truth is not harsh and therefore unnecessarily hard to hear. Are you tracking with me? If so, can you just give me an amen out here? Amen. amen. Okay, so for our third and our final point in our, our place we're gonna zoom into is in the last couple of verses in this passage that we looked at together. Verses seven and verse 10. Paul says, I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. So what Paul is doing here is he's talking about his mission. He's saying, I was sent for the Gentiles. Peter was sent for the Jews. And it, it wasn't just their roles. There was tons of different roles within the early church. There were the organizers, praise God for them. <laughs> there were the people who would like prep food for like huge feasts. There were the prayer folks. There were the uh, people who were dedicated to taking care of the elderly. There was leaders like they, they had, everybody had different roles. And that is still true for us today is that we all have different roles, but it's for the same end goal. Paul preaches to the Gentiles. Peter goes over here. Uh, he's going to go to the Jewish people. He's closer to home. Paul's going way out there. They all had different roles, but they had the same unified goal. And the unified mission was to tell about Jesus, was to show his love and to care for the poor. They knew this is what we are called to do. And for those of us who, who have decided to follow after Jesus, once you, once you buy in, once you decide to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, Savior, accept his forgiveness. Like once that happens, a lot of times there can be this real zeal that comes out of you. But then there's also this reality that I really can't do it all. And, and eventually over time for many of us, it kind of fades and it can even become like, I really feel like I can't do much at all. And even when I try, like I get overwhelmed, like, I don't know how to do this. I don't even know how to like 
help the gospel move forward. I don't know where to serve the poor. And like, I'm just so busy. I remember uh, this is about 13, 14 years ago at the church before we had this expansion. In fact, um, the now youth room that's like beautiful and awesome was an unfinished basement with just concrete down there. And we were preparing for our kids play. And so um, we like release the kids just like we did at the, at the middle of the service here. And they all go downstairs and we had everybody all together. So like pre-K up through 12th grade in one room together. There was like 70, 80 kids or something running around, um, which now there's like 70, 80 pre-Kers, I swear, running <laughs> in a room down there. But, uh, but th this is all of our kids uh, uh, running around. And I, I remember coming down, I had just led worship and um, I'm going down to check on the kids and everything. And it's like mayhem. It, Kidsman was not what it used to be or what it is now back then. And so I'm like, Johnny, sit down. She, I didn't say shut up, but I wanted to say shut up. But I'm like, be quiet. <laughs> and I'm like, you gotta, you got like this, this uh, sibling is like beating his sibling up. Like it is, it is. I'm like, what, what is going on down here? Weren't you just singing praises to God? And then I'm like thinking I should, I should probably get my heart right. Cause I'm like yelling at little children out here trying to bring some semblance of order. And so I'm yelling at him. It's not moving the needle one iota. They might stop for two seconds, but then they're right back to whatever they were doing. And then um, my fiance at the time, Sarah, walks in calmly, just walks in. She goes, sits down. Everybody's going crazy. She's just like, class, class. And they're all like, what, what? And they all, and she's like, would you just come and would you just sit? We're going to do our Bible lesson. And they all like, Doop, 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 doop. sit down. She's like, just sit crisscross applesauce with your back straight. And they're all just like, I'm like, what kind of voodoo magic you got over these kids? I need to learn whatever you know. I, I'm like, this was, I, you know, and she's tried to teach me. I'm still like at about 3% of her abilities. But um, and that's like a lot of growth for me, honestly. But I, I remember, uh, I remember thinking in that moment, you know, working with these little kids, probably not the play for me. Like I could connect really well with a teenager, a young adult. Like I, I got other things that I can do that can serve God and, and help accomplish his mission. But this is not the place and the space for me. But this definitely is for my fiance. Like she is killing this out here. And, and this is kind of the point is that for every one of us, like look around this room. There's, there's, there's so many different people with so many different gifts and so many different talents. And all of us have different roles and purposes that we can accomplish, that we can do together. And there's going to be certain things that you're really bad at. And that's okay to try to test it out and explore it. But there are God-given innate gifts and abilities and passions that God has wired just in you. Like you are made in the image of God and God was a servant. God came to show love and care for others, to use you to help accomplish his mission in his world. Like this is the most thrilling thing we get to be a part of here on planet earth. And this is why I think there's, there's so many passages in uh, scripture all about the body of Christ is uh, because the body of Christ is so diverse. Like you're the ears and you're the nose and you're the mouth. Uh, you're the bigger mouth over there. <laughs> Don't nudge your neighbor if that's what you're thinking right now. But like we all have these different roles. Like we can't do it all, but it's all important. And it's pointing towards what Paul is saying is not only a goal, but is the chief goal. Now, uh, remember that story I told earlier about that, that family uh, Bible study group that I was a part of. Now, uh, the way that that uh, came to be about is my wife and I were talking about how, hey, we want to get some more regular community going on in, in our lives. And um, what's interesting is that the, the people that we ended up texting to be like, hey, let's do this for, for a season and let's try this out. The people we text were people that were all people she served alongside in ministry. 
because those are the people she was in relationship with. And I, I feel like I know so many people in the church, but she, she knows less. And so she was like, hey, what do you think of the, I'm like, this is great. Let's, let's do this. And then it was that very community that ended up helping shape my faith throughout this week. So I want to invite the worship team back out. And, and I, I, I want to say this, like, if, if you heard this scripture and you read it at first and you were like, man, I just don't get it. I don't want you to walk away feeling like, man, the Bible is just always confusing and I can't figure it out. That's part of the gift of being around other believers. And that's part of the gift of being in rooms like this. But here is the truth about scripture is that scripture affects us in three ways. It affects our head. It affects our heart and affects our hands. So what we did today is hopefully we, we learned something new that's affecting our head. And uh, we talked about using our hands, which is going and serving other people. But I, but I want to give you a minute to have this affect your heart. And, and I'm not looking for some like huge emotional response. Uh, if, if that happens, that's appropriate and that's fine. But what I mean by it affecting your heart is allowing you a chance to be able to talk about whatever it is that's been on your mind this morning to God. The God of the universe actually wants to hear from you today. That's the conversation he is looking forward to. So um, I'll give you a couple of prompts that, that may help this conversation if, if it would be. Like, what are maybe some of the barriers that are keeping you from intentionally being in a regular faith community. Like, what is that? And maybe it's busyness. Maybe it's, it could be a whole variety of things. But talk to God about that. Talk to him about that. And remember that our faith is in God, but it's practiced with others. But a second question you might want to talk about is in, in what new ways might God be calling me to serve? And the truth is, is that um, whether you're a stay-at-home parent or you work in, in the workplace, like those are all ways to serve God. And when you do that with excellence, you serve God well in the workplace. But, but I also want us to think for a moment about other ways that he may have called us to use our hands. And this is not because we're like in some place in space, we're just like desperate for volunteers. We sincerely want to make pathways that allow you to use your God-given gifts and abilities and to discover passions that are inside of you that can affect a real community together. So I invite you to bow your head and to close your eyes and to talk, God, talk to God about these things. Maybe you wanna listen or maybe you wanna speak, but I'll give you a minute to do so. So God, this morning, I pray you continue to shape our, our minds and our hearts to be more like you. That even when we serve, we don't do it to try to earn something. We do it out of expression of love for you. Would you continue to speak to us and guide our hearts? We know we can't just try harder. So instead, Lord, I just pray that your gospel would fall and flow deep into our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Would you stand and let's worship the one who is the centerpiece of all of our faith. His name is Jesus. Jesus.